Welcome to the Sword and Trial. On today's episode, Graham and I talk about why we are Baptists and we're not in any danger of becoming pedo-Baptists. Uh, that's been a conversation that uh, we've been a part of with in different venues over the last few weeks, and we thought it might be helpful to have the conversation on this episode. So we talk about things like our favorite authors, both pedo-Baptist and Baptist. We uh, talk about some of the arguments that have kept us Baptist, things like essentials and distinctives and how we are to look at those that we disagree with on essentials and distinctives. And as a little bonus, we also give you uh, the keys to Graham's house. So you can uh, tune in and listen to this episode and learn all these things and more. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome to the Sword and Trial. The Sword and Trial's podcast of Founders Ministries and Founders Exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of local churches. I'm Tom Askell. And I'm Graham Gundon. So Graham, why aren't you a pedo-baptist? <laughs> You know, uh, people have tried. People have tried to get me to become a... I know. You actually went to a Presbyterian college. Yeah. Right? And uh, came out less Baptist, more Baptist, same? Um, More Baptist, actually. More Baptist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't realize that when I enrolled and I matriculated into... It was Reformation Bible College. Mm -hmm. Wonderful undergrad. Mm -hmm. Um, R.C. Sproul started the school, so it's very Presbyterian. Um, I didn't realize when I got there that there were two types of Christians. There were Presbyterians and there were Baptists. And that was it. <laughs> and maybe there were, I don't know, Lutherans somewhere out in the Off void. brands, right? Yeah. Um, so I found out very quickly that I was a Baptist. Oh, I okay. never had thought of myself that way before. You just thought yourself as a Christian, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. There are places like that in the South as well. I mean, you grew up in Michigan, but there are places like that where you, you, you wake up one morning when you're in junior high and realize, hey, there are people called Catholics. What is that? You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, and we love our Reformation Bible College and Steve uh-huh. Nichols and you know, what God has done and is doing there and mm-hmm. recommended people there and no folks there and grateful for it. But there's been a lot of talk recently about, you know, uh, what's going on with Baptists because we got uh, Baptists that are becoming Presbyterian, becoming convinced of uh, the legitimacy of uh, sprinkling babies or pouring water on babies' heads or mm-hmm. uh, something like that and saying, you know, that's that constitutes biblical baptism. And so I've had people reach out to me and say, hey, you know, are you in danger of becoming Presbyterian? And, you know, I'm thinking, well, no, what, did I say something? Did I do something? You know, and uh, it's, it's we're not. I mean, Founders Ministries is uh, very much committed mm-hmm. to the 1689 Confession, which is a very clear Baptist document. And it's a Baptist document that was forged in the the fires of a lot of these distinctions being prominent in the 17th century. Mm-hmm. So uh, we are Baptists. We thought it'd be fun to talk about why we're Baptists, why we're at, not in danger of becoming pedo-Baptists, mm-hmm. though we love uh, many, many right. pedo-Baptists. Uh, the, the Presbyterian brothers are our friends and mm-hmm. uh, brothers, and, you know, good night. We've had Joe Beakey preach in our church regularly, and mm-hmm. we will regularly have him as often as we can work that out. And he's speaking again at the conference uh, next year. We're delighted for that. And Joel and I are friends, and we can laugh about and, and talk seriously about our differences, recognizing that what we have in common is so much greater than what yeah. we have in difference. Yeah, well, I mean, the reality in my life is I've probably had, at least numerically, more Pado baptists disciple me effectively than I've had Baptists disciple well, me effectively. that's true for me, too. Yeah. Um, and not even just living Presbyterians, but also dead ones, long yeah. dead ones. Uh, <laughs> Look in, on your shelves, reading, right? Yeah, and reading their works. And so, obviously, you know, I think both of us have benefited greatly. And the Reformed uh, Evangelical Church broadly speaking, has benefited greatly from them. So if you had to list, uh, say, the the top five, I want to say theologians or authors, let's just say dead mm-hmm. authors, what, what would those be? Uh, of any type? Yeah, any any type. Um, or let, theological, Christian. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Augustine, you got to throw Augustine in there, um, certainly. Yeah. Um, I would say probably Stephen Charnock. We got two two paid up to so All far. right, come on, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me nervous. <laughs> um, uh, definitely, uh, uh, Nehemiah Cox has been very influential on me. My mm-hmm. covenant theology. Um, two to one. Yeah, two to one. Um, Octavius Winslow. Who I mean, okay, he, he, <laughs> two and a half to one and a half. <laughs> he ended in the wrong place, but you know. Um, and then what am I at four? 
Yeah, one more. One more. Um, probably I'll I'll just throw in uh, Boethius. Who? Boethius. Okay, Boethius. All right, so you're going to have to go look him up on uh, Google, right, or <laughs> Wikipedia or something. Yeah, well, I think for me, it would certainly be Augustine and then Luther. Uh, I mean, I just I love reading Luther. He's fun as mm-hmm. well as uh, uh, convicting. And and Luther almost became a Baptist. Yeah. You know, if it had not been for those pesky Moosterites, he know, probably I would know. have become a Baptist. He was on his way there, at least, it seems like. Uh, Spurgeon, you know, I'd have to mm-hmm. throw in there as well. Andrew Fuller has been very influential on me. So, uh, what do I got? Two and two? Mm-hmm. Need a tiebreaker? Yeah. Oh, boy, this is tough. This is tough because I'm thinking of a lot of guys that would tip it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the other way. But, yeah, I'd, I'd have to say Calvin. Yeah. You know, I just, yeah, love reading Calvin and learn so much for him from him. So, now then, what about, say, top three Baptist writers that have um, influenced you? Yeah, John Gill. Uh, I already said really? my John Gill's influence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you like? Yeah. Best I, well, I love his, uh, his exposition. Um, okay. I use his exposition just about every time. I preach. Do you ever find him uh, maybe putting on the lens of the five points in places where it is not warranted? Um, I see him using Hebrew too much where it's not warranted. <laughs> well, yeah, his Hebrew grammar uh, is very impressive, but I've been told by people who are Hebrew scholars, yeah, you need to, you yeah. Know, it was a great, it was a great effort, you know, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that may be true, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, the, I mean, I love Gil. I uh, wrote about him in my dissertation, and uh, but I did find that. And, and sometimes, I mean, it was almost comical, but, it, you know, I appreciate what he was doing. He was polemical, man. He was just mm-hmm. polemical uh, all the way through. So you got Gill and John Owen. John. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Send all your emails to Graham. Okay. Send all your emails to Graham on, on that one. Uh, you know, I, my, my middle son, his, uh, his middle name is Nollis after Hansard. Hansard Nollis. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So there's a couple. Have you made name three yet? Gil uh, Nollis. Gil Nollis and Nehemiah Cox. Nehemiah Cox, you already said mm-hmm. him, yeah. Okay. For me, it would be Spurgeon. It would be Fuller. Um, boy. I mean, Gil, certainly. I love love Gil in, in his theology, his his manual. Of, I mean, his um, um, body of divinity mm-hmm. is very, very rigorous and helpful. But I would probably have to say Dag. Mm. John Dagg and his uh, manual of, of ecclesiology, church order, and then his manual of theology. He's so warm. That's what I love about Dagg as much as anything. He's he's not polemical. You know, Boyce, James Boyce, very polemical. And so if you want to kind of engage some of the mm-hmm. historic traditions and arguments against his views, that's a good place to dig in. But you can read Dagg devotionally mm-hmm. and the, the prayers that he starts each chapter with. So those would be my top three, yeah. I think. All right, so you've gone to a uh, uh, Presbyterian college, though they're very warm and friendly yeah. toward Baptists. Mm-hmm. And I hear they even have a Baptist professor now. I don't know him That's or know that specifically, but I've been told that. Yeah. Um, and yet you're still a convinced Baptist. Yeah. So why? why? Why don't you just give in and <laughs> go ahead and sprinkle babies and make your life well, easier? Well, you know, I think that, that for so many, because, you know, obviously being trained by Presbyterians, I was, a, I was a member of a PCA church for five years as well. I think that so many people see that as their trajectory. Mm-hmm. You, know, you don't grow up Reformed, you know, you're dispensationalist, Arminian, whatever it is. And you see the truths of the Reformed tradition and how they're reflected in Scripture. And I think a lot of people see that as, well, that's then the natural trajectory. Right. Well, you would give up on creobaptism as well. You would accept pedobaptism. And uh, I never really saw it that way. Um, I think that the Baptists, what the, the Baptist position, the creobaptist position, that's the further progress, right? That's the, that's the way that Reformed theology and soteriology mm-hmm. leads it, lends itself. Um, so the, the big thing for me was covenant theology. Um, which is, I think, one reason why a lot of people go pedo Baptist. But I was never convinced by the arguments. I was never convinced by the one one covenant, multiple administrations paradigm that the uh, that the Presbyterians put forward. Um, and I never really understood exactly. Okay, I don't see it in Scripture, but I don't really have an alternative. You know, in the a lot of the modern work on 1689 and federalism, the Renahans, um, 
the work that they've done on that, Richard Barcelos, that was, when I came across that, that was so helpful in clarifying my, my mind. You know, what, a, what is a biblical understanding of the covenants? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so the big thing for me was covenant theology. It was, that was the major thing for me, why I never became a Pado baptist even though I was in Pado baptist context. Yeah, yeah, and, and for me, I mean, I, I got there uh, differently when I began to discover covenant theology. I mean, my world was rocked significantly, and that was after I discovered the five points of Calvinism and Mm -hmm. had already been rocked as well. But in trying to work through covenant theology, which I had to do in writing about Gill and Fuller, in, in against the whole Puritan Reformed background out of which they came, uh, the thing that I saw as well was, yeah, man, there's there's something that uh, people are seeing in Owen, in Ames, in Vitius, that they seem to take to their logical conclusion that mm-hmm. makes them and keeps them Baptist. And I remember even while I was writing my dissertation, Ernie Reisinger, who was a, a wonderful friend and mentor of mine, so kind to me that he, he was getting nervous as I was talking to him about what I was discovering, you know, and he, he said, you're not, you're not going dispensational, are you? You're not going new covenant, are you? I said, no, no, I'm just reading Owen. You know, I'm just reading Owen here. I'm reading Vitius. And, and uh, I couldn't find a copy of the Economy of the Covenants by mm-hmm. uh, Herman Vitius, and it was a crucial, everybody was referring to it, the sources I was tooling around in. And so J.I. Packer was down here uh, one time. He'd been at Ligonier and came down and preached for us, and we were having some time together. And he was asking about the dissertation, how it was going. So I mentioned that, and he said, well, I'll loan you my copy. <laughs> so, okay, so he mails was me. Was it his, still in Latin? No, 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 no <laughs> fortunately. You know. So he mails me his copy, and he just, you know, put a nice note in there. He says, just please return it in the condition you found it in, this type of thing. So I'm reading this, and it's just glorious, and uh, talking to Ernie, and he's, he's nervous. And so he, he borrows Vitzius and reads it. And he said, this is awesome. And he gets the Dendalt Foundation to reprint it. Awesome. And that's how it got back in print uh, in our uh, current modern era. But seeing that and the consistency of it led me to the conclusion of, okay, this, this is a, a proper hermeneutic uh, consistently applied all the way to the end that the new covenant really is new. Mm-hmm. And only the participants in that really new new covenant should receive the covenant sign yeah. of baptism. And there's a book by, I read years ago um, by John Quincy Adams called Baptist, the only thorough reformers. And, you know, he goes right down to that same really? point. And uh, in my mind, it, it makes good sense. And again, we're not trying to pick fights yeah. with our Presbyterian friends. We're talking about distinctives that extend out of essentials yeah. and on the essentials. I mean, you, you outline it really well in the way you describe your convictions. And we're just, we're one mm-hmm. with people that don't claim the name Baptist on those yeah. essentials. Why don't you, why don't you tell folks how you describe yeah. your own views? You know, the way that I identify myself, I think, you know, the way the, the Lord would identify me as well, you know, I'm a Christian. <laughs> whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are you identifying as today? The way now? the Lord identifies okay, me. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, yeah. We're, we're Christians, and so we're united with Christ by faith. And within the the, the realm of Christianity, there's orthodoxy, mm-hmm. you know, and, and those are essential truths of the Christian faith that and, you can't give up. You and know? what would what would be something that would uh, express uh, orthodoxy? You know, uh, a proper understanding of our triune God as okay. one. So and Nicene three. Creed. Yep, Nicene okay. Creed, Apostles' Creed, Athanasian right. Creed. Right. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm orthodox. I'm I'm a Christian. Uh, but I'm also Protestant, mm. um, and from there, I'm Reformed, mm-hmm. and from there, I'm Baptist. And mm-hmm. so it's, it's almost like a funnel. And yeah. the, the further you get down the funnel into those distinctives, the more, the more detail there is, and also the more light there is. Yeah, so you can have some commonality with Christians who are not Orthodox, Mm-hmm. Some commonality. You know, you're not going to start a church with them. You're probably not going to partner with them too too much. No. But then Christian and Orthodox, you have more commonality. Mm-hmm. You can link arms with Christian Orthodox Reformed, even more commonality. Yeah. And then when you get down to Baptist, now we're talking about okay, let's start a church together. Let's uh, yeah, let's do the things that we're called to do on the ground level all across the board. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that we would. Uh, feel like, oh no, we can't cooperate. Well, and there's one thing I think that Baptists do struggle with a little bit today is they, they struggle to see the church beginning before Martin Luther. Um, (laughs) You know, everyone who's Protestant, they're the, they're Christians. And we, but I mean, we've got brothers in Christ going all the way back to Clement of Rome. To John the Baptist. To John John the Baptist. I mean, Athanasius, Augustine, the Cappadocian, all these brothers in Christ who, yeah, certainly we wouldn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. Maybe soteriology Mm -hmm. would be one of these issues, ecclesiology. 
Um, but they're, they're brothers in Christ. It's they're, they're members of the universal church, and we need to accept them as such. Yeah, and I, another thing that complicates the thinking about this and even talking about it today in a lot of ways is that using that little uh, uh, funnel that you mm. described, you got people today who call themselves Baptists who are not Orthodox. <laughs> yes. And so you, yeah. know, you look at that and you say, well, you know, an Orthodox Catholic I would maybe have more in common with them than uh, a heretical Baptist. Yeah. And, and I've tried to argue, not very successfully, through the years that in order to be a Baptist, you got to be a Christian first. Yes. You know, But there are Baptists who own the name Baptist, and um, they do not seem to honor the Lord Jesus Christ in the way mm-hmm. that they live, the way they talk, the way they act, the choices they make. And yet, and who I'm needs the Nicene Creed? That's yeah. that's right. That's just a bunch of Catholic stuff, and we're not interested in that. <laughs> yeah. So it's a complicated issue, but uh, founders, we, we try to think about these mm-hmm. things exactly the way that you've outlined them. But yeah, man, we are committed to the historic Christian Orthodox truth. Tom Nettles has this uh, paradigm that he uses when he's describing Baptist identity. And it's very much the same thing. You know, we're, we're, we're Christian, which is kind of the assumption. Uh, Orthodox, we are evangelical, we are Reformed, we're Separatist, we're Baptist. Mm-hmm. I think those are the five steps of his Baptist identity, and that is right. So, yes, we can be co-belligerents even with those who are not Christian, mm-hmm. but we will be more likely to be co-belligerents with those that are Christian uh, than those who are not Christian, regardless of what they might call right. themselves or how right. they identify themselves. But just because we're co-belligerents doesn't mean that we're embracing each other as as um, brothers in the faith. But once you become Orthodox and you move down that scale, you know, Evangelical Reform, well, yeah, you know, we have a lot in common. Baptist, yeah. But when you when you put that funnel together. Mm-hmm. The, the bottom realm of it, it's pretty small. You know? Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, it gets and, bigger the more you go up. And, and, you know, in all this conversation, it's not like we're saying that, you know, we may be wrong about the Baptist issue. We, we may be wrong about credo Baptist. Maybe, maybe it is okay to, no, I mean, absolutely convinced. Like, yeah. Presbyterians love you, but you're wrong. Yeah, you know? absolutely. The word of God determines how our worship should be conducted. The word of God says nothing about baptizing infants. Therefore... Yeah. We baptize believers only. Yeah, I think the regulative principle that you just articulated is is one of the finest arguments mm-hmm. for this. Okay, which is historically the major argument that the Baptists put forth and why they became Baptists in the first place. Yeah, that's right. The Word of God needs to control what we do in worship, and where is this sprinkling of babies in in that? But I mean, having said that, our Presbyterian friends would also say we think you're wrong yes. to not do this. And that's okay. Brothers mm-hmm. can look at each other in the eye and say, you know what, I think you're wrong here, and you think I'm wrong here. But we agree on so much more that we believe we're mm-hmm. right about, and God's taught us in his word by his spirit, that we can link arms, treat each other as brothers, and cooperate to the degree that we can yeah. without declaring war on each other. And we may not share a local assembly with Presbyterians, but someday soon we'll probably share a jail cell. So <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> right. You know, I was talking to a brother last week about that and some of the um, intramural debates, and they're, they're actually wars that are breaking out, it seems <laughs> like, within uh, some of our camp in, in terms of the Baptist world and even the Reformed Baptist world. And uh, I said, you know, uh, w- whenever they come to arrest us and they ask us, okay, you know, do you think Aquinas was a good guy or a bad guy? They're not going to give you a different type of bunk in the gulag. You know, yeah. <laughs> you're all going to be uh, in the same and, and gulag. And there is together. a right answer to that question. But <laughs> even so, curios Christos, you That's know, right. we, we agree on that. As I'm sure you know, Founders Ministries has the national conference coming up pretty soon here in 2024, January 18th through the 20th. And we are doing a pre-conference sale, early bird price. It ends April 30th. So make sure you get in on that. The speakers this year will be Tom Askell, Conrad Mbewe, Phil Johnson, Joel Beakey, and others. And the theme is remembering Jesus Christ. So make sure you get in on that early bird pricing. Also, our newest book from Founders Ministries, Scarlet and White, has just come out by Chris Marley. It is a biblical theo- theology of the bride of Christ. We will be having an interview with Chris Marley coming up here shortly, so stay tuned for that. The reason we hold our distinctives is those reasons are the same 
as the reasons we hold our essentials. Mm -hmm. We read the Bible, we're convinced, and uh, we want to be humble, we want to be generous, we want to be gracious, but Mm -hmm. we don't want to say, well, it doesn't matter. I would much rather, in fact, I have far greater fellowship with somebody who says, no, man, it matters. You need to be sprinkling your your babies Mm -hmm. uh, who is convinced biblically of that, then somebody says, yeah, it doesn't matter. You know, you can sprinkle babies, not sprinkle babies, and baptize believers, or, you know, it, that, that doesn't matter. Give me people who want to be carefully biblical, who have a right, a generous spirit, yeah. Catholic spirit, mm-hmm. a, a true, in the best sense, ecumenical spirit mm-hmm. about that, because I think we can go a lot further with uh, brothers and sisters who have those kinds of approaches to scripture and what the Bible teaches than somebody that's just willing to kind of cut it off and say, you know, this is important. The rest of it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, you and I were talking a while ago about, um, as long as I've been reformed, you know, I've seen Baptists becoming Presbyterians and I get part part of that's because just the context that I was in, in a Presbyterian context. Uh, but for me, you know, seeing friends become Presbyterians, it was always the covenant theology Mm -hmm. issue. Um, and there are other, Issues as well, you know, there's a lot of camaraderie in Presbyterian denominations and the way that the, their churches operate. Um, but it seems like today, more often than the covenant theology or exegetical arguments and, and all that kind of stuff, um, what is pushing people towards pedo baptism is some of the culture, yeah. cultural issues, right. cultural war issues, social issues, and things like that. And it strikes me it's it's not an accident. Um, now, we can talk about all the biblical exegetical arguments for paedobaptism and, and all that, and those conversations need to be had. But we also need to remember that in the Reformation, um, as they were trying to kick out all these vestiges of Roman Catholicism in their worship and all that, they never kicked out infant baptism. And, and I think part of the reason for that is because of the way that their societies were set up, the mm-hmm. way that their s- civil governments were set up. Um, they were Christian states in which yeah. if you were a citizen of the state, you were a Christian. And you were then to receive the sign of baptism because you were a Christian. Well, if you're born into the Christian state, you're a citizen, right. which means you're a Christian. And so that's part of the reason why in these in the Reformation, the, the infant baptism never went away with the rest of Roman Catholicism. And so infant baptism and kind of social cultural issues have always been tied together. Right. Yeah, that's right. And Baptists have not been uh, monolithic in their understanding of the relationship of Christianity or the church to Mm -hmm. the culture. I think what we've inherited uh, in in some regards to our detriment in the 20th and early 21st century as Baptists here in America is this very uh, subjective pietism that what it means to be holy is to do your daily devotionals and to to think about you and God Mm -hmm. and make sure, you know, all those things are right. And once you've done that, you can close your Bible and get about your work that you have to do so you can come back and keep yourself holy or when you go to church. And that's a truncated view. Mm -hmm. And and certainly not all Baptists have thought that way. Um, And, uh, you know, if all you've ever heard about church-state relationships is what Roger Williams uh, had to say about it. Well, just remember Roger Williams was a Baptist for like what, eight minutes or something like that. You know? So, I mean, he was on a trajectory and he, he's passed through Baptist hood, uh, along the way, but there are far more, uh, uh, our historic Baptists who had to think about this as they were being beaten mm-hmm. and as they were trying not to be, uh, drowned and uh, mm-hmm. put to the stake and sometimes by their Protestant brothers yeah. you know, who were doing that. So the, the idea that Baptists have nothing to say to the culture and Baptists should not engage in political uh, enterprises. Baptists should not uh, say, thus saith the Lord, you know, you may not have your brother's wife. Uh, It was a Baptist who said that, but nevertheless, (laughs) you know, this idea that, oh, no, 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 you're getting out of your lane here, Christian Baptist, that's wrongheaded. Uh And I do think a lot of Baptists, are feeling that subjective pietism being kind of encroaching on them or or that this is where you're supposed to live and the whole world is uh, going to hell and rising up with demonic forces to Mm -hmm. try to destroy the work of God and the people of God. And some of these folks are thinking, why are we not picking up the sword? Why are we not? And I'm talking about the Bible. (laughs) Why are we not saying what the Bible says? Why are we not calling God's deacons? who hold governmental authority, uh, authoritative positions to account yeah. to the God who appointed them. Why are we not on the march against the kingdom of Satan? You know, the 
Jesus says that the, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, which means we are on the march against the gates That's of right. hell. We're battering down the gates of hell. Why are we kind of in our own little enclaves here, not worried about what, what's going on on that, the rest of the That's world? exactly right. And, and some people will hear that. Say, oh, no, you know, you're January 6th or, you know, you're, you, <laughs> yeah. you, you think we ought to be storming the Capitol. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about taking the sword of the spirit and and not just, you know, looking at it and, and talking about how great a sword it is, but actually wielding it. Mm-hmm. What do you do? Well, you, you cast down arguments. Mm-hmm. You know, you take every thought captive. You refute those heretical ideas like transgenderism mm-hmm. and homosexual Christianity and uh, this idea that you can be a, a Christian and support abortion and abortionists and abortion legislations mm-hmm. and abortion platforms in political parties. Right. No, the word of God says you can't do that. And if you've been bullied or deceived into thinking, oh no, but I'm a Baptist, you know, so that just means me and Jesus. So yeah, you know, I may vote, but that may be the extent of it. You're not thinking rightly. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you're not only not thinking biblically, you're not even thinking in a healthy way, according to the history and heritage that you have as a Baptist. Mm-hmm. And because we've kind of lost that, I do think that a lot of Baptists, in fact, I know it in some cases, have just jumped over and said, well, the Presbyterians, they're trying. Yeah. You know, they're doing stuff. I'm going to go join with them. You know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to plant my roots down here because, you know, they're trying to speak for Christ, own the lordship of Christ over all of the world. And the Baptists are just kind of shriveling on the vine, sitting by watching people be destroyed. Yeah, and and one thing that the Presbyterians do have right is that, you know, if you want to see cultural renewal and if you want to see cultural reformation, which we should all want, um, it's a generational thing. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not going to happen in my generation unless the Lord pours out his spirit. It probably won't happen in the generation of my children. But it's it's a long-term thing. And so yeah. you need to be faithful to raise your children right and to, mm-hmm. to do well by your children, to raise them in the fear of the Lord, that they would raise their children in the fear of the Lord. I mean, that's incredibly important. And it seems as though Pado baptists emphasize that more than Baptists do, which should not yeah, be the case. That's right. They, they, they have motivation to be thinking that way regardless mm-hmm. of their eschatology. And I do think a lot of pessimistic eschatology keeps yeah. Baptists and others from thinking about that. It's, man, we just need mm-hmm. to do what we can right now in these few years because it's all going to burn and, and go down. And when we're, when we're talking, I'm sure you mean this too. I mean, we're on the same page on these things. We're talking about multi-generational. We're not talking about uh, doing things apart from the power of the gospel and the right. regenerating work of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. God gives children to Christians uh, with incredible benefits and blessings. That does not mean because my children are born in my household that they're going to be Christians. I mm-hmm. want to be clear on that. There's no bloodline Christianity. There's right. there's no uh, second generation faith. Every child born in my household, every grandchild must come to faith in Jesus Christ personally. God has no grandchildren. Yeah, exactly. So with that clear understanding, we believe in regeneration and we believe in preaching and teaching the gospel. But we should also believe that uh, though 1 Corinthians 7, 14 doesn't mean what our Presbyterian friends think that it means, it means something Mm-hmm. That there is a sense in which the children born into my household are holy in a way children born into atheistic households are not right. holy. Right. They're not saved. You know, they're no guarantee that they're going to be saved, but mm-hmm. they are set apart mm-hmm. and they are given incredible privileges. And you think about how God works. The God who ordains the ends ordains the means. Mm-hmm. So if he intends to save someone, he's going to bring the gospel into their lives. Right. Okay, well, he's brought the gospel into my children's lives. He's put them in a home where they're going to hear about Jesus. and They're going to be brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If I'm owning my responsibility the way that I should, those means are in place, man. That's like saying sick them to a bulldog, Mm -hmm. to a Christian parent. God, look what you've done. You've already done this. Save them. Why would you put them in our household if you're not going to save them? Those kind of arguments are, are powerful arguments right. in praying and in continuing. And even when your kids are indifferent and even when they, if God forbid, if they go into the far country, you can still pray. God, they know. God, you've taught them. God, the word is in them. And it's it's like Elijah, you know, just putting the, the wood on the altar. Uh, all that wood is there. All that is needed now is for fire from heaven to fall. Mm-hmm. There's something to burn as opposed to a kid who grew up in an atheistic household right. who has no gospel. Yeah. So with that, 
man, we ought to be the most evangelistic, the most hopeful, uh, the, the most determined, the most uh, uh, filled with real joy and anticipation uh, Christians in going about proclaiming the gospel and being willing to say whatever the word of God says in any sphere that we have opportunity to speak. Mm. If we're not willing to do that, I don't think we're processing what God's given us, what he's called us to be in proper ways. Mm. So you're not planning to renounce your Baptist distinctives anytime soon, huh? No, no. My, my four favorite digits are one, six, eight, nine. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to break into Graham's house, just go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll be going to change the codes in my house. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're grateful uh, for you joining us today for this conversation. Again, we love our Presbyterian brothers and sisters and uh, praise God for them and books on our shelves. We've been mentored mm-hmm. by them and we, we uh, give honor where honors do, but we are Baptists and we're not in danger of becoming pedo Baptists. So we want you to also think about these things with us and we want to help you any way that we can. If you want to know more about this, man, pick up a copy of the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. We have it in modern English. It's easy to read and you can study through these things, both the essentials and the distinctives for yourself. So thanks for joining us today on The Sword and the Trial. Why are we here? What is the most important thing in the world? One of our greatest problems is is forgetting. We, We forget what God has done for us. We forget what God has taught us. We forget things that we have experienced. If we don't pause, if we don't think deeply, if we aren't reminded again and again and again, we forget. It strikes me pretty significantly in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, remember Jesus Christ. Why in the world would Paul tell a pastor to remember Christ? Well, he's not going to forget that Jesus Christ lived and that Jesus Christ taught, but he's gonna forget the significance of Christ. Christ is ultimately our mission. The church is the body of Christ. A church has to focus on the supremacy of Christ because that's why we are the church. Christ is supreme over all. The church's great mission is to preach Christ. We're there to win souls. to advance Christ's kingdom. The problem with the world is not that they don't agree with me. The problem is that they don't bow the knee to Christ. So that's why we're going to gather, to specifically, explicitly focus on the supremacy of Christ, to do our best to remind each other of the centrality of Christ, the beauty of Christ, the glory of Christ. So join us in Fort Myers, Florida, January 18th through 20th, 2024, as we focus on Jesus Christ. I hope to see you there.